Amen and amen. I wonder what that means, all that is within us to bless the Lord. I think that means the good and the bad, right? Even when you feel doubt, even when you feel uncertain, if you will just bless the Lord and believe on what he has said, great things can happen. In the book of Acts, Paul and Silas were in prison. And the Bible says that they were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. So I don't think we quite understand the power that there can be in our singing and in our praise, right? Because then in verse 26, it says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So let's think about our own bonds and about our own midnight when we're up and we're just weary and we're worried. Let's, let's let those be loose tonight by the power of God in our singing and our praising in the words that he's given us that we can speak together. And let's rattle this place. Let's shake it up, shall we?
guys have heard of Ezekiel. He was led by the Spirit of the Lord into a valley full of dead, dry bones. And the word says this, that God told him to prophesy over these bones. He said, God, God said, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, you know. He said, prophesy over them. And I will cause sinews to come over them, skin to come together, and they will, they will come back. He said, I'll call from the four winds, and I will breathe breath into them, and those bones will sermon series revived and we do the sermon series like this to point out um, kind of subjects and topics where our church's focus for you the vision for from us to you to you know kind of together that we talk about all the time is to serve your family so that and grow your ministry individually you should have a ministry of even just your close friends your family wherever that starts you need to start thinking about the gospel in your life as a ministry. And that may be new to some people, but for our church, it's not new. Growing 500 people in the last less than four years uh, means that people take on a ministry. It means that people are sharing their faith. When we see um, youth sponsors baptizing teenagers, when we see dads and mom baptizing uh, their family members, their, their spouse, and their friends. That means people have a ministry. So all the things that we could do, tailgate parties, Bible studies, children's events, we don't just have them to have them. We have them so that uh, we can help you grow your ministry. And that means that uh, the church as a whole has a ministry, but you have a ministry. So a lot of times people's ideas of ministry are, well, I'll volunteer at the church, and that's a service-type ministry. We have to have that. And, and you know a church like this where the, uh, the, the congregation is getting larger, but there's a small staff. What does that mean? That means every single person has to be a minister of the gospel. It, it means that uh, not one person can lead every small group. It means that uh, nobody's going to know all your friends except for you. And the people that come into the church are going to come because you invited them. There's a sermon that was preached uh, in the New Testament, it was so powerful that many thousands of people came to Christ at one time. It's found in Acts chapter 2, 30 through 38. I, I, I want to read it with, at least part of it with you. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades or didn't, uh, did his flesh see corruption? This Jesus 
God raised up, and that we were all witnesses. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and have received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let the house of Israel therefore know uh, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is it. This is what happens when we hear the word of God. And so when we talk about when train sin, the purpose of our church, to win people to Christ, to train each other up and to be sent, this is what happens. Uh, this is the church's response to a sermon like this, preached by Peter to, the, to, the, to Jerusalem, to, the, to, the, to his, to his feather, uh, the nation of Israel, basically what's left of it at the time. As they're coming back and they see uh, what has happened to the apostles as they see the day of Pentecost happen, as they see um, that something has changed, that Jesus has, has raised from the dead, and they hear this good news. Now, what happens to us? Almost everyone we know has access to that information, don't they? Almost everybody we know celebrates uh, the birth of Christ, and a lot of people know about Easter, uh, what we celebrate as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, they already know that, so they're not hearing it for the first time. And so sometimes I think when we, we, we read a, uh, about a sermon or something that happens in the gospel or the book of Acts where there's preaching and teaching the gospel and many thousand people accept Christ, we think, well, what can I do? What is it that I'm going to do? Well, this sermon series, Revived, is this. What if everybody lived like you do? What if everybody in this church um, attended like you, served like you, and gave like you. Would we be a, a, a better church or a worse church? What would happen? Would we exist or not? I think it's important for us to evaluate that because uh, our relationship with God, not only is it corporate, but it's personal. We don't just have a religion. You could call it a religion that, that we uh, love Christ, and so the outsiders would call us Christians, and we would identify as Christians, okay, because that's how people, but you have a personal relationship with the Most High God, you're his people, that's what we, we accept that gift of salvation, that new covenant, that's what we do. So, it's personal, what, what would happen if everybody was a Christian like you? Did you talk to somebody about Jesus this week? Did you give? Did, did you serve? Did you volunteer? Is it, is it part of your excitement when you get up in the morning to tell people about Jesus and live this life for real, or, or are we an attender? By the way, thank God that people start as attenders, right? Thank God that people show up and serve, and not everybody's in the right place, but I think it's fair for us. We need a life that's revived, and the way we're going to do that is by asking ourselves, what if everyone was a Christian like me? You know... It, the gospel started, and what happened, what we see in the early churches, we have reports in the book of Acts. We have briefings that we get from all the churches. And what's incredible is when people get invested into the local body of believers, they start saving up to give. They start attending and meeting together on a daily basis, which we do here. And we have people in Bible study right now in one of the back rooms. Uh, all morning on Sunday, we have classes. I mean, Gary's got uh, assigned people up to lead classes. We got so many people in classes at 9 a.m., right? The whole back part is full. We got people in classes on, on Wednesday night. We have youth groups and Sunday nights and, 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 and different nights of the week. People are gathering and they're, and they're learning the Bible. So that's, li that's like the first century church. When people are excited about Jesus and understand that people's eternal destiny depends on it, they start changing their life. They start changing the way it is. Maybe it is your example. You've only seen the dead church. I was thinking about this this week because there's been many people come into our church in the last couple months. 
I, I would say from, from last December till now, uh, that's probably rivaled the amount of new, because see, we have people that have stayed home, whether they're immune compromised or whatever, but they, they maybe haven't been to church in a year, right? But we've had so many new people come in, but where, where do we often come from? What's our church experience? If, if I asked everybody here, what church did you come from? Was it a time where the church was booming and growing and people were getting baptized by the hundreds and the tens and the thousands? I mean, what was it? Did you go to a church that you loved to go to and your kids sprinted in to go to children's ministry? Is that where you went to church? That's not where people usually are at when they talk about their church history. Most people came from a church and it's like, eh, you know, I was supposed to go, so I went. Or they came from a church that shrank and shrank and shrank and it maybe doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it's the size of town. Maybe it's just there weren't people moving there. It, does, it doesn't matter. The point is not many people came from an alive, thriving church and moved here or, or, or changed to here and, and, and it's like more of the same. Some people just don't have a church background. So you actually, if you're from a situation where it wasn't thriving, you may not have a model of what your life needs to look like in a church that thrives. Guess what? If your life is starting to be revived then the answer to the question that I asked just a little bit ago is what if everybody was a Christian like you? If everyone else was a Christian like you, you, you should be able to answer, yeah, more people would be in this church. My role is filling up. My people in my circle are starting to hear about Christ. Even if they're not here, they're hearing about it. I'm telling them my story. If everybody gave like me, percentage-wise, this church would have budgets, Right? If, if everybody, get, if we would be able to win more people to Christ. If everybody, give, if everybody served like me, we, Katie, you'd never have to ask for children's. You'd never have to ask for this or that. Boy, you wouldn't be able to touch a chair around here because I'd pick them up and set them down like, like hotcakes, right? It's like, it's like, wow. And yet, I think we can all look and we can ask ourselves and we can go, ah, well, you know, I, I'm not quite here yet. That's okay, that's why we're preaching the message. I have um, been showing you videos of friends of mine from all over the country. All of them have churches uh, that are awesome. We're going to watch a video in a minute of a guy named Nathan Freeman. He's in Florida. He took over a Christian church that was dead, had about 100 people in it, and now it has over 1,000 people in it in just a few years. They needed somebody, and yet his story starts like many of our stories, and I want you to hear his story. Watch this video with me of Nathan. Hi, my name's Nathan. I'm a lead pastor in Fleming Island, Florida, and who led me to Jesus is definitely a large group of people. Uh, I was a teenager, and I was making some really bad decisions, um, so much so, uh, getting in so much trouble that my mom finally called the youth pastor and said, hey, can you try to fix my son? He's really whacked up. And so uh, the student pastor would come and pick me up every uh, week, at least once a week, come and meet with me. And which, to be honest with you, was really embarrassing because I'm just like, okay, what in the world? This man's coming to pick me up. This is so lame, you know, because I was kind of too cool for school, you know, for something like that. And he would meet with me. And I bring up a couple things. Number one is this, and that he was so perseverant. I mean, he was continued to love me, even though I was very much unlovable at that time. And, um, and so, but his perseverance paid off big time. It really stuck with me even years after. Uh, even a couple of years, I think it was two years later, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And number two is that I was stonewalling him. I was that like, uh, nothing's wrong with me. Something's wrong with you. You know, that was just kind of that kind of kid and just very stubborn, strong will, rebellious. But yet, the church continued to pour into me, uh, even though I was, you know, very resistant. And finally, in that foundation that was laid by the student pastor and countless number of people, uh, I was ready to hear the gospel message one day. It, it just set up uh, for me to to respond 
with conviction when it was time for me to give my life to Jesus Christ and I was immediately baptized that same day. And, and all that was possible because a student pastor, along with a whole mess of other people from the church, continued to love me and continued to support me and just believe in me, even though, um, to be honest with you, from the world standpoint, there wasn't much to work with. And now because of the way the church has loved me, now I get to have the honor of serving the church in a, a very amazing way as a pastor of a growing, thriving church in, in, in Fleming Island, Florida. And I'm so thankful to serve alongside your pastor, Austin, there. I mean, he's amazing, and, and it's just great seeing how the church manifests itself in the beauty of grace and truth and love, whether it be Nebraska or Florida. So I am honored and so thankful that I get to serve the church in a very special way. And uh, so really, it's the church and a crazy student pastor who poured into a really, really stubborn kid. How, about, how many of us know people who need Jesus? <laughs> we all know people. Everybody we know that doesn't live for the Lord. And by the way, we know many Christians that need to be revived in their faith. But there's a reason that many times we don't care about this. There's, there's a reason why we get offended hearing God's word. Do you ever get offended reading God's word? I think sometimes maybe we get offended when we don't understand something. But I mean the personal stuff. Does it offend you when God talks about um, immoralities? Does it, does it offend you when God talks about, I mean, Jesus talked more about your money than he talked about heaven in the New Testament. Does that offend you? What happens is it's our God. We're used to worshiping that stuff. We're used to worshiping our old life. And this is what the Bible has to say about this. And by the way, if you don't know where to start reading the Bible, just pick it up and flip to the Ephesians, Galatians. If you're a believer and you've never uh, read the Bible, some Christian living is going to help you. And you can just start anywhere, but, but a book like Ephesians or Galatians would really help you, Romans, something like that. Because listen, we need to love God in our obedience. Yes, it's not our obedience that has saved us. It's not. You were never good enough to be saved. It's, it's, it's the sacrifice on the cross. That's the love of God. That sacrifice saved us. But we love God, and we're his children. And the, and the more that we want to experience the, the fruit of God and not the world, we need to listen to this. And Ephesians 4, 23 to 23, it says, to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life. It is corrupt through deceitful desires, through deceitful desires. That's why we get upset with the word of God sometimes, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. We have to be renewed because of the way our mind used to work. We need that. The Bible tells us to be renewed. It's a command for the, God's people in the New Testament church, be renewed. It's kind of like the word revived. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. And here's the great part. The Bible tells you what the will of God is. For you to grow his kingdom. And sometimes it'll say the will of God is for you to be moral, to be set apart for him. But it'll also, it also, the whole purpose of the New Testament church is to grow God's kingdom. I wanted a way for us to see this tonight. So I, I have um, some boxes for you to look at. You ready for this? Here's some boxes. Now, this is the church box. You're sitting in it right now, figuratively and literally. You're not in this box. You're in the, okay, you get it. Okay, that's the church box. And then we have another box. That's the world. You just came from that, okay? This is also, I, what my kids will always say something. Dad, literally, literally, I fell off the swing. And I'd say, what would that be like if it was you figuratively fell off the swing? All right. So it's both. It, when the Bible talks about us, the Bible, real, this is, I found this old stick in the church. I think it was from 
You know, we tore something this like out of the ceiling or something. Anyway, it's us. Okay, this old stick is you. Not to be offensive, but it's without the COVID holiday weight. But anyway, we live in the world. A lot of us come from the world, unless you grew up in the church, right? A lot of us, but, but even if we did, when we go to school, when we go to work, we're in the world. And the world box it, I mean, that we live in, it's got all kinds of promises on it, right? And, and we go after these things. And this is what the verses that we're talking about, this is what they're talking about in our terms. Listen, it's, it's money, right? The world promises money. Even if you don't have money, we will throw our life away for money sometimes. We will for the promise of it. We'll go into, look at all the college kids right now, right? Right or wrong, they want to go, because somebody says, well, you, maybe you can't make money. Somehow, when you grow up, you can't make money unless you go to college. And so, and so people drown in debt to even try to look like they have money. There's people in our neighborhood who I'll talk to, I'll talk about coming to church, and, and, and here's one of the hurts that they have when they come into church. It's like, you know what? Um, I want to be able to give, but I, but, but I have a house payment, and I've got two car payments that rival the house payment. Because why? We want to look sometimes or feel like we have money. So the world says the money is important. And in fact, the Bible says God won't put up with the idolatry of anything, and money's going to ruin your life because you're going to worship it as God. And, and here's one way to tell you, and I've told you this before, but it's so true. If you're offended about money, when we talk about giving, then guess what your God is? And God does not take second place. It should be part of your worship to give. And to tithe only happens in the local church. If you're, if you're, if you're gonna give your money biblically, understand that the tithing only happens in the New Testament in the local church. Giving and sacrificial giving can happen on top of that. But, th but this is where it happens. And if you're offended by that, talk to Jesus about it when you're praying a little bit later at communion. And he'll make your heart right, okay? But giving, I love to give. I'm trying to teach my kids how to give. I love to give. I love to do it. I love to go back to the giving box during worship and give. It's part of my worship. I, I get great joy from giving. But the world says, don't do it. You need that. That's yours. And, 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 you, and you know what that feels like. Well, we'd be just silly to pretend like the world doesn't promise that sex is what your life is all about. Really not just sex, because sex is made for marriage, and God created that. And God said, when you're married, don't ever not have sex, right? Your body's not your own. But the world wants you to, Satan wants you to have sex outside of marriage and stop having it when you get married. His, his plan is the opposite of God. And so, also, sex is distorted in the world because God, uh, Satan wants you to have it outside of marriage. And a lot of people do not want to come to church do not want to get serious with God because of this issue. Because they want to break the rules of God and have it outside of marriage. The biblical design of marriage is between a man and a woman. That is the only marriage. The definition has to be redone for the world. But this is the reason some people will get angry and never come to church because of sex and all the things. In fact, people create cults. They, don't, they deny the name of Jesus they deny this sermon that Peter, why? Because of their ideas on this. Yet God has a blessing and you're supposed to have, uh, God create it. You're supposed to, Christians, uh, your, your permission in marriage is supposed to be the very best. However, Satan and the world want to corrupt it. And so that's in the world box. And so that's what's presented. And this will harm us. And then also fame. Everybody's trying to get famous. And, and everybody knows that social media, now anybody can be famous. So we're going to chase this. The likes, the affirmation, feel good about people acknowledging who you are. Now even uh, fame is a part of love. If you love me, you'll ex look at that. If you, if, if you love me, you'll accept what I'm doing. And that's part of fame now with social media. And so we want likes and clicks. And, and, and if we're famous, then we'll also get rich. And then the sex will come. And, you know, all this promises. This is what the world box has. It's not extensive. It's never been new. The Bible says none of this is new. Jesus addressed all of this, plus more. He talks about the thoughts and actions that are in our soul, what we've taught ourselves to do in our mind, what we're thinking, and he died for all of that on the cross. And this 
is, of course, the world box. Well, the church box is, uses different words, even though um, God owns all the money, right? It's all his. We're just stewards of it. God is the creator of sex, right? And God has made you famous because you're a child of the most high God. But the world tries to steal that stuff. I get all the work on the church box. But the church promises a lot of things like the right kind of faith. You have faith in all kinds of stuff. If you're in the world box, your faith is in the corrupted, sinful idea of these things. But when you put your faith in the most high God and start living your life by him, the reason we're not revived in our personal life is because our faith is in the world box, not the church box, period. It's idolatry, and that's what the Bible calls it. Uh, if you want to unlock the secrets of the Bible, here's one. God doesn't put up with second place. Remember I said that? This is one of the great truths of the Bible. God did not crawl up on the cross, get beat beyond all recognition, plan it for thousands of years and tell his people, enter into a new covenant with us so that, so that we have faith in something besides him. He just doesn't accept that because he loves us too much. Then we're talking about love. The church box offers love, but the world doesn't believe it. The world thinks this stuff is love. The world thinks uh, if false, agreeing with me, pacifying me is love. That's not love. Love is sacrifice. The biblical love that we read about in the New Testament, the Greek word of God is love, is God is sacrifice. It's talking about what he did on the cross. When you walk into the church and somebody sacrifices their moments to make sure you're having a good moment, that's love. When somebody sacrifices their comfort in a service to go watch your kid who's screaming, crying, and kicking them, that's love. Trust me, I know that. When somebody is willing to come back here and give their nights to teach your teenagers about Jesus, sacrifice, that's love. When you'll spend your money on the stakes to invite your neighbor and your smoker and your cooker or whatever, that's starting to figure out what love is. When you'll go out of your way and take the time and get over the fear to tell somebody about what Jesus is doing in your life, that's sacrifice, that's love. It's not teddy bears, right? It's not, oh, I feel good about you. That's a, that's a byproduct of love, it can be. How many of you have been committed to your spouse but haven't always felt gushy about it? Anybody that's been married longer than five minutes, that's who. But you sacrifice and then that, those feelings are a byproduct of that incredible sacrifice that you put on. And that's what God does for us. And, 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 the, and the Bible talks about joy but many people don't have it, why? They don't live their life to grow God's kingdom because they think, well, that's the pastor's job or that's somebody else's job. No, being revived, it's a personal relationship between you and God. You're a minister. You're one of God's saints. I just had a, 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 a person that I'm working with this week. They talked about, well, what are the saints? What are the saints? I said, well, you know, uh, a denomination or this and that might give somebody sainthood, but the saints are people who are baptized into Christ in the New Testament. They're ministers, they're children of God, they're the saints of God. It's you, if you've been baptized into Christ, you're one of his people, you're a minister, and when you grow his kingdom, joy. Not happiness, not a fleeting feeling, joy. You're never gonna get the joy that the Bible talks about unless you're about your father's business. Do you have everything that you need sometimes? Have you gotten exactly what you wanted? When are kids the worst? You ever thought about this? Watch. When your kids are the worst, birthday and Christmas, they'd be the worst. And it's not just the sugar. A lot of times your kids, especially if you have, you know, ones that are decent to be around, the days they might be the worst is when they're the most selfish. Why? Because they lack joy. And so this is what happens, guys, in the church box and the world boxes. We start hopping. Remember, this is us. We start hopping and we try to live in both boxes, right? It, the, we're not supposed to because the old's passed away, but we do. The old has passed away. We're not, we're not supposed to do it. <laughs> and so we go, we go from back and forth, from box to box. And, and if you've been a Christian a long time and you get out of the rhythm of church, you'll just try to scoot these boxes together. And you'll just be in one box and on Sunday and Wednesday here, you know, you're going back to the world, and then Sunday and Wednesday here, 
And, and we go back and forth. One conversation, we're talking here. At, we talk one way at church. We talk another way in the world. We're with our church friends. We're nice and friendly when we're in the world. Friends are worried about us. But the problem is we get so caught up in going back and forth. We don't understand that, you know, that, that this box, it, we get trapped. And this trap will scuff us up. It's mean. And I think the reason we don't know that, the reason we, we don't see that coming is because this, bo this box just has nothing but lies in it. The Bible tells us that, that God and his word, see, it, it has the truth. We don't believe it. So we hop around, and then every once in a while, you know, we get bit. We get in a trap. We get wounded. We get uh, the things that happen to us, they leave marks. And it wounds us, and, and we miss people that we could have told about Christ. We miss part of our life that could have been productive for God. We get robbed of the things that God had for us, the, the, the joy right? The, the, the love and the faith, we don't have those things. The world can't see it. And so we just hop around to both boxes until we get nailed. And it drags us out. You know, God knew that this would happen. And it, it just wounds us and like today, in the Old Testament, Joshua saw this coming for the nation of Israel. And I, I, I talk about this story all the time. I think it, it mirrors so much of what we do. Joshua's preaching, and he's giving the nation of Israel a history lesson from the Exodus to now. Because, see, Joshua's been there with Moses. He was one of the two spies that says, we could go in. And we could take the land that God promised to us. And after they did it, he said, God went before us and he gave us the Amorites and the Amalekites. And he, and he went for us and he did the work. He knocked down these, these demonic figures. The Bible calls them the Gigante and the Nephilim and the Rephaim. And they op occupied God's people's land. And they were trying to stop the bloodline of Christ. It's really a horrible story. And Joshua was faithful. Joshua, by the way, shares the name of Jesus, Yeshua. He says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of the fathers have served beyond the region of the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land of which you dwell. But for me and my house will serve the Lord. I'm also giving a history lesson. But I don't have to tell you your history because you already know it. God has brought you up to where you are today. He has guided you with his hand. He has showed you himself and you sit in his New Testament church saved by the blood of Jesus. He's brought you, many of you, from despair and hard times. He leads you into worship with his people. You hear the word of God straight from his breath that he pinned for you himself through his pro prophets and apostles. We go to his communion each week. This is our history and our legacy. Joshua knew it, and you know it. God has led you from death to life. God saved the nation of Israel, and he has saved your eternal life. What will you do about that? God is asking you to experience, to be revived, to wake up from the dead, to let the dead parts of your life, the parts that you hold for the world, stop doing that. Why? Because you're his child. You're saved, you're baptized into Christ. As we go to communion, we need to remember this. Quit messing around in the box of the world. It has just lies for you. It has just pain for you. It has just traps for you. The Bible tells us over and over and over, and Joshua told the people, choose this day whom you'll serve. 
As we get ready to go to communion, I pray for a congregation who will stand up. The leaders of every one of your households will say, this day, me and my house will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the history lesson of your people, us, and our personal lives. I pray for a congregation of people this weekend that will say yes to you in the most intimate ways. The parts that were considered offensive, they'll blow off and we'll consider them worship and blessing. No longer will we be offended by our false gods in our life, but raise you as the most high God. Bless you with our worship and our, our raising of our hands and our voices to put off the worldly desires and the lies that that box has to give us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one, singing hallelujah. Holy, holy God Almighty, the great I am, oh, who is worthy.
the